Hello and welcome to Cracking the Cryptic. Now, I haven't appeared for a while and that's because I've been having some quality problems with the recordings. Um, so if you managed to watch one that we put up before we took it down again, sorry about that. Um, I think my the camera in my PC has been having some problems in keeping up. So let's hope it does today. Um, I haven't got a real fix for that. I've just tried to uh, leave the PC running for a while, shut down everything else, this might work. We shall see. So I know Simon was worried about problems with his laptop. Mine's definitely got them. What I'm looking at today is a puzzle sent in to us by Caroline Wong, one of our new patrons on Patreon. Um, so thanks to Caroline for uh, sponsoring us. Thank you for sending in this puzzle for us to have a look at. Um, I'm going to show you my solution of this. Now, if you watch Simon's last video, you'll know that I'm not always confined to the rig rigorously logical approach, and it's possible that Caroline won't be satisfied by this solve and will demand to see a more, a more logical approach, in which case I'll, uh, I'll have to ask Simon if he can come up with one. Um, but this is how I solve the puzzle. So I'm going to start it off here and... I do, do, we do urge you, copy down the puzzle. I don't know where Caroline got it from. Um, she sent it in. It was graded as expert. One of the things you'll notice if you copy this down is that none of the shoots, by which I mean the blocks of three boxes across or three boxes down, none of them contains a repeated digit. So they're often the place to start looking for where you can start putting in pencil marks, and they're not available in this. And I mean, I think that'll be some of why it's graded as expert. In addition, it's clearly only got 24 givens, which is a very small number. Um, anyway, I'm going to watch my solve of it. Um, and the first thing to notice is that there are some places where you can restrict the possible numbers within a box to just two. So here, for instance, the only places three can go in this east side nonet are there and there. That three and that three limited a bit. Now, I think it was after that that I noticed that there were no repeated digits. I can see that one is limited to a couple of places here. Um, there are more threes, I think, that can be restricted both here and here, here and here, fours obviously up there. Now, my first conclusion on seeing that this is all one can get out of the initial stages of the puzzle is this is very unlikely to be conducive to simple logic. It's clearly an extremely difficult puzzle. And I know that my best way through puzzles like these are to make an assumption somewhere and see if it works out. So that's what I've done. I've started with these threes. I know that if there's a three here, then in fact, it'll help. It'll give us a three there. It turns out that that three, if that's right, places all the threes in the grid, and that's done very fast. Now that doesn't necessarily help with many other things. We can start limiting the fours here after that, and the ones, We've got that four, that four, that one, that one that are doing that. And having these, th having that three in place puts a one, a solid digit up here. Remember, this is all presumed on if this three is correct. Um, and if it's not, we're going to have to go back and start again. If it is, well, we're going to get through the whole puzzle quite likely on the strength of that. Um, and one of the skills, I mean, I, I saw that some of the comments on Simon's last video suggested that it was very disappointing that I use this method on difficult puzzles. Um, and it suggests that um, I'm not really appreciating the beauty of Sudoku or using the, the information available in a logical way. Well, I can see that argument, but Actually, there's quite a skill in picking which of the digits to bifurcate from. You have to find one or where putting it in gives you something and where taking it out and making it impossible gives you something else. Um, and that's not something that's necessarily easy to do. It's picked up with practice. You also have to be quite adept at learning how to use the lessons it gives you. So this, this version has filled in a lot of the puzzle. All of these steps that I've made here have been absolutely forced 
assuming this three is right. And do feel free to slow it down and work out how I'm making each of those decisions because they're really very straightforward. They're founded either on what's eliminated in the same rows and columns or what's, um, what's entirely obvious from the one row or column. So, um, however, I did come across a contradiction here. I can't remember what that was. Let's have a look and see if I can remember it. So, yes, we've got to this middle box. And where does the four go in the middle box? It can't go in the central three cells because of this four. It can't go in the bottom cells because of this four. And now it can't go in this cell because of that four. There is nowhere a four can go in the middle cell, in the middle um, box. So what I've finally done, having put in about 20, maybe 25 digits, is prove that this three was wrong. So now... I have to take out all of these numbers. Now, if I was doing this on paper, I'd have used a rubber when I put in the th uh, pencil when I put in the three and for every digit after that. So I'd be getting out my eraser, getting rid of all those marks, going back to where I was in pen before that, which was not very far, as you remember. But uh, here on the computer, it takes quite a while because I have to go through every cell. Um, I'm in Hadoku here, and uh, maybe there's a quick way of doing this, but I don't know. So... Um, I will also say that um, using Hadoku, it doesn't come second nature to me, and it's considerably slower for me than using uh, pen and pencil. So on paper, I think I would have done this in six or seven minutes. On, on the computer, it took me ten. Um, so back to this cell. This was not a three, so the three in this box is here. And now that helps, as we knew, with that three. It doesn't immediately help with the three down here anymore because there are two possibilities. Um, but it does help with quite a lot of the rest of the grid. In fact, all the threes can go in again, but in a slightly different order. Um, and that's quite useful. Now we can find somewhere else to go. It's not quite as easy as it was when we had the other assumption for a three. And that perhaps indicates that we're on the more on the right track because this being a, a puzzle graded expert, we should expect there to be some difficulty about it. I'm kind of looking all around at this point. Now I can work out that there's a six in the end column here because of that six and that six. That's limiting a six to one of those two cells and that might be quite helpful later. Um, so after this, we're gonna find that um, where do we go next? Eights in the top left box are limited to two different cells, I can see. And what do I actually find? And yeah, there we go. That puts them in. Um, in fact, eight. Ah, oh, yes. This bottom right box has got a powerful diagonal um, conformation in it. So the eights given that we now put this three in down there, the eight is very limited into where it can go by the eights in column eight and row eight. So that got fixed there. Now we can use this four. Again, this diagonal conformation is very powerful because if you can limit something out of the column that's available, then it must go in the row. And that's what happens to these fours. They go in that row. So this is the only place for a four in the central bottom box. Um, that puts the four where it actually has to be in the central box. And now we can get this whole bottom right box filled. It's always a nice landmark on the way to solving a puzzle when you get one box completely filled. And after that, um, we've got ones are getting much more straightforward there. Most of this, yep, the whole bottom central box is done now. Um, all of the bottom left box, everything we have left is in pairs in rows now. So um, I think I fill those in now. One eight in the bottom row, nine six in the second row, and five two in row seven. So I don't know the order of those yet, but that'll be helpful when we get to that stage. Um, putting in a few more pencil marks now, fives in the central box. And now I've suddenly spotted the only place for a one in columns four, five, six that remains is at the top. So that's probably helpful, although I can, I was, oh, 
shouldn't have put in a big number there, I was trying to put in a little number. And so again, one's there somewhere, still looking for one more breakthrough. And it's quite interesting. I don't think it's very straightforward at this point. I can do a few more pencil marks, but what I eventually notice, oh, the eights actually up in the top left that we, that we found are limited, that sorts out eights and ones, that resolves ones on the left. But we're not done yet. There's still another deduction to make. Um, and what it comes down to in the end is that, I can't remember actually, what, what did it take? Um, we've got those sixes limited up there. Oh yeah, it's something to do with sixes. And we can see that um, in the top left box, the two, the two cells we have left are five and six. Um, in fact, in this box, the only possibility is they five, six, no, two is still a possibility there, so that's not quite as helpful as I was hoping. Um, what does it come down to? There's some way of concluding that this is a six. That can only be two or six. Oh, yeah, well, look, we've got sixes here. So now in row two, where can a six go? It can't go in column nine because of these sixes that are settled in one of those two. And it can't go here because of this six at the bottom. Therefore, it must go there. That took me quite a while to see. It's actually a very straightforward deduction, but it's not quite one of the shoot style deductions that I'm normally trying to make. So that took a little while to see. Once that comes, the puzzle is pretty much finished. Now, as I say, you know, that's how I solve the puzzle. It's a method of solving the puzzle. It gets me solved in whatever it would have been on paper, about seven minutes, 10 minutes um, in, in the application. There's the six going in, and that's going to um, limit the places. How does it work? Remember, that has to be two or seven. How did I work out that that's definite seven? Ah, oh, that's the only place a seven could go in the top right box at this point. We've got sevens in column seven and eight and a seven in row three. So that, that's what finishes off the puzzle now. And yeah, as I say, that's how I would solve this to, to go as fast as I can. It may well be, and I haven't tried it out, that there's a much more elegant method, but if I'm in a competition, that's what I want to do, is get through the puzzle. Um, so I don't know if, if Caroline's satisfied with that. Do let us know um, if that's interesting for you or not interesting for you. And uh, if the latter, as I say, I'm sure Simon will be able to do a video um, explaining exactly how one could go through this with some advanced technique. I'm pretty sure, given the original layout of the puzzle, that it will be a complicated one, but I haven't solved it that way myself. This is the way I've done it. Thanks very much for watching and hope to see you again on Cracking, cracking the Cryptic. Bye. Bye for now.